Vera did as she was told and went with her killers, knowing she was going to die. Danny was just like, get your coat and shoes on now, we're leaving, we're going for a walk. When they told her to put her shoes on, you know, she kind of, she was like yelling, why? You know, like, why? Why do you want me to get my shoes on? And Zachary had went up to her and said, just get your effing shoes on. Had she been given one final wish, it would have been to say goodbye to Willa Dean, her precious little girl. But instead, her last farewell came from the baby's grandmother, who knew this was the end. And as I laid my head down, all I seen was a vision of Danny, Nicole, and Vera's purple hoodie of them walking out on, outside on the porch. And I said, good night, Vera. And she said, good night. She said, good night, sugar baby. And I said, good night. She had 15 minutes to live. began on a cold spring morning. They had her laying, instead of having her laying on the rails, they had her laying in between the tracks. It's like if here's the two tracks, she was in the middle. And he was going so fast with the train that he looked down and he thought that it was a baby deer. And the engine and eight cars went over her. He stops the train, gets out and walks back thinking that he was going to find the carcass of a deer. Because the train, uh, the, the cars were still over her, it looks under, sees that it's a human. Police department, Hello, this is Chris with CSX Yes. Hey, we got a report that we have a train stopped over near Central Parkway, right in between there across the Blanchard River. Okay. Uh, we got a report that we have a train stop right now because they see a naked female body laying in the middle of the track. Appears to be deceased. The location of this grisly discovery could not have been more symbolic. On a train trestle in the center of Findlay, Ohio a town once designated by an official act of Congress as Flag City, USA. It is known for its good schools, low crime, and famous sports stars. And little girls dream of becoming homecoming queens and cheerleaders. But now someone had taken a knife to this picture of all-American bliss and left one little girl under the central overpass, slashed, bruised, and slaughtered. After I found out, you know, she got murdered and everything, it broke my heart. Because me and my sister did everything together. Two months earlier, Finley police responded to a domestic violence call at 300 Center Street. This was not the first time Vera's abuse had been reported, but if anyone was paying attention, 
they would have seen the violence getting worse. I was there a few times when the cops was called. They'd come and be like, we need to speak to Vera and Zachary and Sherry and them would tell her, don't say Zachary did anything. Or be like, you fell down the steps, you, you did it. It was your fault. Only this time, the quote, I tripped and fell excuse would not work. A problem soon solved with a better lie. When her boyfriend, uh, oh, what is his name? They said it was a black dude that I guess she was supposedly dating, but I believe he was a um, created character, as they call it in the video game world. The, I can't even think of his name now, but it's D Demetrius Jones, I think it was. She made up the um, Desmond Thompson guy from Lima. And he had busted her nose because she had to go out to the hospital because she had a bump here. And they said she might have a concussion and bleeding. They come up with this story saying that Vera had a boyfriend, a black man, that was out of Lima or somewhere, and he come up here and got in a fight and punched her in the face and broke her nose. But that's not true. It was her son, Zachary. He came downstairs, went straight to his mom, asked her what happened, and Sherry just came up with an excuse saying that Vera was the one that pushed her own daughter into the coffee table. And Zachary just listened to what she said, went over to Vera, swung his fist and hit her in the face. Even more chilling is what happened next when Zach and Sherry brought in a third party to finish the beating. Zachary got a hold of his aunt, Sam, and when Vera didn't give her a straight answer, Sam, Samantha, just straight up punched her in the face again. And broke her nose. And broke her nose. This January assault is a glaring example of how the system failed Vera. They talked to me and Vera both together because Vera wouldn't talk to nobody unless I was there in front of her. She wasn't allowed to talk unless she was told to talk by Sherry. Nobody else, just Sherry. Sherry had to be the one to tell her she could talk. Uh, that astounds me to this day, that, that the police did it, or wasn't there a social worker there? I mean, it's just sort of police 101 that you say, I want to know what she's going to say, and I know that woman's going to get in the way, so I'm taking her somewhere else, and she's staying there. They could have done that. They could, they could have said, no, you're not coming, you're staying there. Except telling Sherry no is easier said than done. You can tell me to do something, but I, I mean, I'm going to listen to you. To say that Finley PD was familiar with 300 Center Street is an understatement. Even on the day of the murder, earlier that afternoon, police were dispatched to break up a neighborhood brawl. Cops were there earlier because of a fight that I guess broke out because I was woken up. And while they knocked at the door, Sherry was busy inside. How I got woken up was she, Sherry, my mother, sent Vera up to wake me up. They had to hide Vera. Because the police would have taken her out if they'd have seen how bruised up she was. But the police were not there for Vera. They'd been called to a street fight. There was a fight between Danny and my kids with the people down the street. Zachary, Garth, Garth Chucky. Chucky, Danny, and Nicole. They all went down there. Danny had got out of prison like three weeks before all this happened. A detail that made the officers immediately worried. Like, when I first met him, I was actually kind of, like, intimidated because he has tears on his eyes. That lets other inmates know once you walk in the door. See this? I killed once, I'll do it again. The fight was finished by the time police arrived. And while they interrogated the other gang, the Brooks boys were in the house, getting ready to flee. You can't tell me Daniel and Nicole's the only one that escaped the house because they don't know Finley. They're from Tiffin. He had went over to, um, Dave and Sam's the hideout is when I heard because they I remember seeing them jump out my window and told Nikki let's go and they jumped out the window and went over to Dave and Sam's playing a much greater role would be the third person who jumped out Sherry's window her son Zachary me Danny and Zach were actually running from the police because Danny had pulled out a knife on one of the Brooks's neighbors Zach had a warrant and I knew I had a warrant to him. In that short run from the Brooks house here to the Schwab house there, Zachary, Danny, and Nicole 
began a chain of events that would end five hours later with Vera dead on the tracks. And they ran to this house right here. And that's where Sherry even admitted they were at, was right here. And how close is that to the tracks where Vera was murdered? But right then, police had one priority, to find the guy running around Finley, flashing a knife and wearing a teardrop tattoo. In the first news reports, it seemed that Daniel Bixler was some crazy distant cousin who blew in from Tiffin, a town 25 miles east of Findlay. An impression supported by the fact that only three weeks before he'd been released from Allen Correctional after serving almost three years in prison. He admitted he was in a gang at the prison, the 211 boys as he called it. Once free, Danny went on a spree of escalating violence beginning at this park, where in an act of twisted chivalry, he attacked a teenager who had refused to give up a park swing to his new girlfriend, Nicole Peters. It was this assault charge that sent the fugitive couple on the lam, fleeing Tiffin before Danny got arrested. Yeah, he ran away from it. That's why he came to Finley to hide. The reason Danny felt comfortable turning to Sherry is obvious. He was not a distant cousin at all, but a close member of the family. Best illustrated by Sherry's relationship with the other Danny Bixler, his father. Oh yeah, Danny, Danny and I go, we call, they call us the kissing cousins. From this incestuous romance, Sherry conceived the first of her nine children, Scotty Emmons. Scotty Emmons belongs to Danny Bixler, senior. Her mother's sister's kid, he would be her cousin. The incest kind of stuff that's in our family. In 2008, Big Danny stabbed his wife's lover and led police and sheriffs from three different counties on a high-speed chase in an 18-ton semi. When he gets a temper, boys, both of them, when they get a temper, you can't handle them. Even Danny had said it's in the big slur blood. I'm meant to kill, I guess. For a homicide that started out with a naked dead woman with no ID, no witnesses, no murder weapon, no suspects, and no apparent motive, Finley police solved the case incredibly fast. She had been to the hospital before. There was a social worker involved. She had bruises. She had been beat. So it's not like, you know, this was a, a surprise. When they do ask you to talk, is there anything, any big points you plan to, to come across to them? I will make sure that they know that Desta Bixler, uh... Danny, when he was drunk, he, he kind of her. basically told her every single detail about the murder. While we were drinking, um, they were smoking all my cigarettes. So we decided to go down to the gas station, which isn't that far from here. And so we walk down there and we see the train has stopped. And then I'm like sitting here thinking, like why is the train stopped at like three or something in the morning? And I, I asked the lady at the gas station, I'm like, do you know why the train stopped? I'm like, was there something wrong with the engine? Just being nosy and she's like no they found a body and I look back at Danny and he's just staring like he he's froze and th that's right then I, I knew I knew everything that was being said was true like I mean I was scared in addition to Desta's information police also learned that there had been an eyewitness after all uh, across the street from the Brooks's home there was a camera out there for surveillance and they seen them walk across the street. The grainy video shows three figures, Danny Bixler, Vera Regal, and Nicole Peters in a single file line walking south. They did have the knife towards her that if she was screaming or anything that they would stab right then and there. Confronted with this mounting evidence, Danny first tried to push blame on others, then started making damning admissions. By mid-afternoon, he and his interrogators were driving back to the train bridge, returning to the scene of the crime. I ended up taking the knife and throwing the knife in the river. There he pointed to the spot where, just 18 hours earlier, he threw the murder weapon into the water. The blade that he used was from the kitchen. Danny picked it out of my knife set, and he was playing with it and twirling it and all that. For her part, Nicole was more tight-lipped, and to this day, exactly what she did at the tracks remains a mystery. 
But she still was not as skilled at lying as the Brooks family, and it did not take long for her to implicate herself as well. The detectives had caught the murderers. The people that were charged were Daniel Bixler, Nicole Peters, and then people that lied to the police, which there's quite a few of those, um, Zachary Brooks, um, Sherry Brooks, Shannon Brooks, and Michael Brooks. And then they um, have a juvenile son that also participated in lying to the police, and his name is Chuck Brooks. And so everyone zeroed in on Danny, the out-of-control ex-con, and Nicole, his bloodthirsty girlfriend. How old are you today? 18. How old were you when this offense was committed? 17. Some girls go for the bad boys. Like a Bonnie and Clyde kind of thing, but with an evil twist. <laughs> She was obsessed with this man. Like, uh, she'd constantly talk about him. It, it, everything, all of her letters were about how much she was devoted to him, how much she loved him. She cared about him a lot. They had only been together for like a week and a half. So he was out for a week and a half, and then they started dating for the other week and a half that he was out, and then boom, he's right back in again. An indication of how authorities struggled with this bizarre case from the very beginning is that they did not inform the public for a day and a half after the body was discovered. Vera's mom didn't even find out about it from the police or anybody. They went directly to Sherry first. And I think that's a bunch of crap. You know, yeah. the police department wouldn't go to her, directly to her own mother. Did you have to identify the body at that point? Or no, because Sherry already identified it. Because Sherry told the police that Vera's parents died. I'm supposed to be dead. I've died like three different times in three different states. Sherry. These deceptions, which she hones over time, come in two types. Lies to protect and lies to instigate. What happened next is an example of the former. We met Larry one time because he stopped out front of our house and Samantha Schwab was at our house and she went outside and smacked Larry because they got into a fight because they owed money to her and stuff. And he started talking to us and then next thing I know he started hanging around our house like a leech. The Larry Spencer guy shows up, this, 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 uh, this guy who's been at the house once or twice suddenly is, uh, is, is uh, being accused of taking Vera away and probably killing her. Because I've talked to Larry and Larry said that they tried to tell the detectives that was him that killed her. To those who knew about Vera's life inside the Brooks house, the story on its face was ridiculous. They said, oh, she took off with her boyfriend. Well, she wasn't really allowed to have a boyfriend except for Zachary because she wasn't allowed to go anywhere with anybody. They wouldn't even let her have a cell phone. Sherry said that she didn't need one because then she could get a hold of her mom or she could talk to whoever she wanted to. After Danny and Nicole were arrested, the cover story was modified to fit the changing situation. She'll basically change the story up and she'll basically confuse everybody. And she's trying to cover up a murder, period. The witch's spell had worked like a charm. I believe that my own mother had this set up perfectly. She knew exactly how to do it. She can get away with shit. Yeah. There are certain things that um, she's done in her life that sh should have been put her behind bars. And it was pretty much slap on the hand, go ahead, walk away. Gone were any questions about what role she and her family played in Vera's death. You just not want to say my name on there saying that I had anything to do with this. Now it was as if they were just passive spectators. The only thing people wanted to know was how they could sit there and watch Danny and Nicole do something so barbaric. I asked her a million times, Sherry, why didn't you call? Why? Why? I mean, even the five-year-old knows if somebody's being hurt, you call the police. And as the accusations intensified, the truth of what happened got further and further away. Like someone's really gonna be there to help me say, hey, go get the phone over there off, the, off of my computer stand so I can uh, call the cops. 
You know, they're not going to, Nikki's not going to give me the phone. Dan's not going to give me the phone. Scotty sure in the world's not going to give me the phone. And Shan and her fat ass was sitting on the couch playing with her phone. I just, I wish I would have had my phone working because it was, well, it was dead and I had no minutes, even though I know you can call 911 off of it, but... No matter her age, Vera was still a child. If there's a way she could do it, she would do it. You know, never, never complain. Always help. She'd help you any way she could. If, if you told Vera something, she'd do it. I mean, she didn't question. Um, almost to the point that it was too much. I, was, I wish she could have maybe stood up for herself a little more. She was mentally challenged. She was slow. And Sherry and them end up talking her into moving in with them. And, you know, and then she ended up hooking up with Sherry's son. For Vera, her old life was gone, like she had joined a cult and got separated from her past. When Manson um, put ideas in his minions to where he's pretty much the puppet master and he's doing his puppets to uh, do his dirty works for him. Brooks family being like the Manson family, yeah, I had to agree with that. They are like that. They're... A family that makes sense, whatever she meant by that. Yes. It's a cultish type of thing, and I really believe they saw her as an easy target. We was at the Salvation Army, and she came in with the Brookses, and she see me, and she kind of lit up, because she always smiled, you know, like that, you know. And um, she'd come over, she'd put her hood up, and as she walked by, can't talk, can't talk, can't talk. She'd stop, and I'd put my arms on her and give her a big hug and ask her where her baby was. And she said, oh, she's at home, but boy, she just run away. I mean, flat run. There wasn't no stopping and talking. Uh, and that's not Vera. Because they didn't want her to talk to no one about what was happening at the house. That's what they were afraid of. They basically did not allow Vera to maintain a relationship with her parents. It didn't take long for people to see a change. Before she started uh, dating Zach, she was happy. She was pretty much outgoing. I mean, she loved to sing, she liked to dance. Loretta Lynn, Dolly Parton, she liked all the older country. But when she moved in with them, it just, she changed real quick. What I can't see is the Vera that I knew willingly massaging and Sherry's feet. That was her job there, was to rub her feet. I guess she, had, she has foot problems because of diabetes or something. But that was her job. When she did mom's feet, if she did something wrong, mom would hit her with the itchy stick. Well, Sherry had this, like, uh, not a back scratcher, but it's a little bit thicker. She'd just whack her alongside the head. Don't touch my baby. And Vera would just keep telling her, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. She'd say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Why she was saying I'm sorry for, I don't know because I guess she just felt she was doing something wrong. They even made her sleep with a pig. You're allowed to have a pig live in a closet to where he urinates and has feces all over. Oh no, I'd never make her sleep with the pig. But she did. Of course she did. She made her sleep with the pig. They had the cops called continuously, children's services called continuously, and God knows why nobody done anything, you know, to even remove the baby itself exactly. out of that home. I don't understand that. She was such a frequent flyer, as we, as we call them, that you could answer the phone, and, you, and as soon as she says the first word, you know who it is. You eventually become kind of desensitized to them calling, and it's not that people mean to do that, it's just you know that the major problems are ones that nobody's going to cooperate. Vera told the cops, no, I'm not moving back home with you guys. And the cops said, how old are you? Vera's cognitive level, I would, I would compare to my daughter who's, who's eight years old, okay? I wouldn't expect the police to take my daughter's word for it, you know what I mean? Because Vera even told CPS, when CPS asked her, Vera, are you in danger here? Do you like it living here? Vera said, I love Sherry. I love staying here with Sherry and her family. She says, Sherry's my family. She helps me out, and I would never leave Sherry. They came back here and told me that they talked to her, and because she was 24 years old, even though her mind was an eight-year-old mind, 
they couldn't do anything because she was 24 years old and she made her choice. It was her bed. She needed to lie in it. It was total control. And they'd make her do like just pretty much everything and nobody else would take up and do something around the house. It was always her. They actually treated her like a slave. They wanted her as a slave and her, her SSI check that she got first of the month. That was legal. She, they got that done. Don't know how they did it and who knows. I mean, they must know enough. It sounds like they got a pretty good, pretty good racket going. Maybe I ought to go on SSI and, and have people stay here with me and they sign over their paychecks to me. And each of them getting around 700 yeah. a month coming into one place. The Sherry's on disability, all of her kids are on disability, and then everybody else that moves in with them are on disability. But more than Vera's money, Sherry wanted her womb. Everybody that gets pregnant that lives in that house, you know, she always says, oh, I hope you have a girl, you know. Vera Jo Regal was killed because of two conflicting motives. I have four kids of my own. I have three girls and one boy. Well, when I first had my first daughter, she said she wanted it because it's a girl. Because in her mind, any girl that she could get, she was going to get. The primary motive was based in Sherry's obsession with baby girls, an abnormal perversion that began in childhood when she, like Vera, was sexually abused by her own father. And he molested her quite often, I guess. The man who nicknamed her Sugar Babe. That's her number one name right there, Sugar Babe. That's what everybody calls her. Since I was a little girl, my dad gave that name to me before I was put in foster home. I actually felt sorry for her. Uh, she did tell me about you know, her experiences with her father and, and how he had raped her. And, and, and I began to kind of understand um, a little bit of how this woman come to be the way she is. As a young child, Sherry and her three siblings became wards of the state. She was put in the children's home when taken away from her mom when she was like three years old, and then she came back when she was 16. It was then she made her first attempt to take someone else's baby. She told us when she came home when she was 16 that she had a baby over here in Tiffin and that they welfare wouldn't let her have it. And my mother would always say, did you have a baby while you were in foster care? Because if so, if you, I'm going to go get it. Because it was Sherry's baby, and that would have been my first grandbaby, so I was going to get it. But B and them said, no, it wasn't uh, Sherry's baby. It was the foster baby there, too. It wasn't her baby in the first place. And then we talked to Sandy, and Sandy Snyder says that's the welfare lady that was taking care of in her case and stuff, said that she is an obituary liar. And that's why she, she's a fantasy world. She lives in a fantasy world, like. And that way, whatever she thinks, that's what really happens in her world. Well, see, she'll tell you something totally opposite than what everybody else is telling her. She'll lie. She's many, many times has done it. And people have fallen in her trickery and they believe everything she said. Because she's convincing about everything. I mean, she's, she convinces everybody everything. Who will hold your hand as each one walks out of your home to pain that will put my mark in your hand? And I'm talking about Sherry losing all of her kids one at a time. I'm really confused about all that because I thought once you have kids taken that you're not allowed, especially if you have five, you have all those kids taken and then you have a second round of kids and you're allowed to keep those? They removed Maria and two other, well, Scotty was one, uh, Michael was one, and then there was another one, but I don't know the name. Which was Joshua, Michael, Maria, and little Sherry was all taken away from me. In three of the cases, she lost custody, at least in part due to reports of sexual abuse. My sister was coming over to pick her up, wanted to take her to, out to her house. And the railroad track was right beside her house. So there was a train going by. She didn't hear my sister knocking. And she was even hollering out Sherry's name. And Sherry didn't answer. And she said when she walked in there, Sherry was supposed to be giving the ba a little baby bathtub thing there. And she was holding the baby up like this here, sucking its penis. 
She's sick enough that she even molested me when I was younger. Sherry's first five children were not removed as a group. She would have one, lose it to CPS, then have another, over and over and over. I see her more times when the baby girl was born than, than when she was with the boys. I mean, when that girl was born, she would let her out of her sight, let no one hold the baby. Or if someone did, she would, like, look at them until they put the baby down. It was just, like, like kind of obsessed with Maria. By all accounts, it was the loss of this child, baby Maria, that was most traumatic. She'll always be my girl, my little girl, no matter what, and that she's my first daughter, and that I always want her to uh, know that she's always welcomed here to meet me anytime she wants. Every other kid she had, she didn't take care of right, but Maria, she did real good with Maria. We really was proud of her. She kept her for a whole year. But in the spring of 1987, Sherry reverted to her old ways, and things went horribly wrong. My brother one night called me up saying that we needed to take the baby to the hospital, that she had been molested. She was bleeding from the vagina. Somebody had raped my, our little Maria, because when she went to change her diaper, she was all bloody down there. That night, Sherry reclaimed her baby, but the authorities were on her trail. They told her to take her to the doctor the next day, well, Sherry didn't take her to the doctor. So we went over and she says, Mom, take Maria home with you. That was at Easter time one time. I took Scotty home with me and I gave her Maria to take home for the night. And she never let me take Maria home at all. She says, I'll keep Scotty over here and you take Maria home. So I did not come to my door the next morning and here it was the sheriff wanting Maria. She wanted all of her boys to at least have one kid by the time they were 16 or 17. An example of this is Gina Lopez, a 15-year-old girl with a troubled family life who fell in love with Cherry's second to youngest son, Garth. She is like, give me a grandbaby. I like grandbabies. I want another grandbaby. And as soon as she was carrying a Brooks baby, like Vera before her, the stalking and the threats began. I had a job at the time. I was working at this little shop at the corner of Center and Main Street. I was working there and they would follow me. Sherry, Zachary, Garth, and Chucky, they all work as a team. Chucky would be the one that always followed me most of the time. Zachary would sometimes. And then when they knew it was time for her to get off, they would send, it was mostly Chucky, they would uh, send him down to like kind of spy on her to see where she went after work or if she came back to the house. Fortunately for Gina, her pregnancy ended in a miscarriage and she was able to reconcile with her mother and move to Kentucky, putting a couple of hundred miles between herself and the madness up in Findlay. Vera loved that baby. That that was Vera's pride and joy right there. She was the one that was always babysitting for um, Stacy's uh, little girl. She always had her. So I could, I could see her really being a mother to her own child. Except Sherry was in charge, and she saw things different. Sherry had a lot of boys. I think she was really, really obsessed with girls, especially since Maria was taken away from her. And I think, you know, with Vera, I mean, she has a chance to... You know, she has a chance to take that one rather easily. Sure, has always wanted a baby girl again. She was going to have somebody make her a, a child, another daughter, and then she was going to try to take him away from her. And Sherry said, that's my kid if you get a girl. And she told Zachary, it better be a girl. She did tell Zachary that if it is, turns out to be a girl, that he, she wanted him to sign off his rights to her. And he did, he did that. He said, yeah, that was fine. And this was not just any womb chosen for the assignment, because Sherry once targeted Vera herself to replace her lost baby. Yeah, I was there when she lost Maria. I, I was at another, 
because we lived on Sandusky Street, a white apartment house there, and they lived, her and her ex-husband Mike lived upstairs. For five months, from the time baby Vera was born in November until the sheriff took baby Maria at Easter, the two little girls lived in separate units of the exact same house. She was, she was trying to take over on Vera when Vera was a baby, and I, was, and I told her, no, that's my baby. And so, remarkably, Sherry ended up taking the baby of the baby she tried to get 24 years earlier, claiming custody of baby Willa Dean before she was even born. Vera was like way out here. You would talk to Sherry or you'd see Sherry as my baby's in there, my baby. That's my baby, my baby. You know, it's always my baby. They kept on telling Willa Dean that Vera wasn't her mom, that Sherry was her mom. And every time Willa Dean wanted to come to her mom, like her learning how to walk, she'd walk around and she'd see her mommy and she'd want to run up to her mommy. And Vera would say, no, 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 I'll get in trouble if I touch you. So I seen Sherry after Willa Dean was born maybe, I don't know, four or five months later. You see my new baby? So that's Vera's. No, it's mine. I, got, I adopted this baby. So it was no longer Vera's. Vera never had anything, could not do anything with the baby. She touched the baby, Zach hit her. That was Sherry's baby, not Vera's. Another example of Sherry's control appears in the date of the child's birth. Well, I'm November 3rd, she's November 4th. It is here we glimpse the true depth of Sherry's madness. She gave her um, castor oil and orange juice. To have the baby come out earlier than what it was supposed to be. According to a website with the castor oil industry, the recommended dosage for inducing labor with this old midwiving technique is two tablespoons. Because she gave her that castor oil, we gave her about three bottles of it. And it was about three bottles, yeah. To make her go into labor so she'd be there for her birthday. Well, it didn't happen on her birthday, it was the day after. Because she bragged about that. She said, well, we didn't get it on my birthday, but it was closed. So she was an early baby and she ended up with having a in the hospital for a while because she had heart problems. Supposedly her original date was supposed to be December 6th, that she was supposed to come out. But she decided she was coming out to have uh, pumpkin pie and mashed potatoes with Mama for Thanksgiving. So she come out early and she wanted to meet her Mama. <laughs> The secondary motive was far more common. I don't think he really wanted to be with her anymore. He wanted to be with other people, but he couldn't because Sherry wouldn't let uh, Vera leave. Hey, he just said that they needed to get rid of her and that he was seeing some other girl. And Vera's relationship with Zach at this point is what? Completely over. She wanted Zachary because, well, they had a baby together, and she wanted Zachary for herself. If Zachary, he would get really mad of her being jealous and go over the wall sometimes. At first, before she got beaten into submission, Vera would fight back. Vera sometimes could be rebel rebellious, sometimes she had a lot of anger. Vera could cuss you, Vera could tear you up. Zachary ain't allowed to talk to a girl or look at him or anything. She was always mad. And when she got mad, he got mad. He uh, whipped the phone at her face, like right here. And her eyebrow ring came completely out. Like meat was hanging out and stuff. I raised my kids not to hit a girl, if, uh, but, but if they're going to put their man, self in a man's place, then yeah, then do it. In a normal family, the father would step in and stop this kind of abuse, but not Kevin Brooks Sr. He's the opposite of Sherry, where Sherry was loud and upfront and boisterous. Kevin was a background person who liked to stay out of every day and mind his own business. Even when minding his own business meant letting Vera get beaten. You know, he, he was, he's an arch coward. And you think this thing that happened one day, it's been going on for months and months and months. And when it became clear that they were really going to kill her, Kevin looked out for Kevin. He already did his 30 days, but he had, at the time, waiting for his 30 days to get in lockup. He's like, if you're going to kill her, wait till I'm in jail so that way I have an alibi. Those were his exact words. 
Crazy as it sounds, if Vera was going to be saved, it would have to have been one of the Brooks boys. That was Punky. He was the one that was killed in an accident. Unfortunately, the only one with enough balls to stand up to Sherry was already dead. He ran that household. Punky ran that household when his dad and mom were both afraid of him. On July 3rd, the summer before Vera's murder, Punky was walking with his girlfriend on a dark, rural highway. They were heading towards their town to go see the fireworks. That's not what I was told. That's what Sherry told me. He was going for the fireworks. But yeah, I know he was going for a He a was going thing. to get uh, Heather's heroin. The old cab driving by, couldn't see him, no bang. She was really crazy because of him dying and the ashes are still at the house and everything and she won't bury him. My son's laying up there on, his, uh, on the bottom shelf in that box. It seems like she gotten worse. I mean, it's just like Sherry went crazier. I mean, you talk about Punky, Punky, it was like, wow, Punky, you know, all the girls went wild for Punky. From the night he was hit, Sherry could not accept her son's death was an accident. Now she was out for revenge. The accident happened 20 minutes before they got any call. And Sherry was all mad about that and then was trying to put the blame on Heather, saying that Heather pushed Punky. Sherry had told Heather, you know, I just, I just want the truth. Did you push him? And Heather looked at her and said, no, I did not do it. But when it comes to Sherry's fantasies, what actually happened doesn't really matter. Heather pushed Punky in front of the Ackard cab that helped kill my son that night. Sherry said that Heather is the one that killed Punky, had it set up, so that's why Sherry had Marcy beat Heather up right, there. Marcy was, I believe she was standing on the porch. She was like standing by Sherry. And then Sherry had whispered to her, she said, I need you to do me a favor. That went down crazy. Then out of nowhere, Marcy just takes her hand and starts punching her in the face. And took her by the head of the hair and rolled her down the steps and started beating the hell out of her. They're like, bring her to the road, curb stomp her. And at that time, Heather's nose was like bleeding really bad and you could see that it was broken. All she kept saying is, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And she kept putting her hands up in her, the air. And Zachary said, this is fucked up. Then uh, Marcy told her, you know, that'll teach you to ever mess with my family again. Because you killed Punky. You had Punky killed. And you took, you took the best thing away from us all uh, when you had Punky killed. Like his brother Zach, as well as Danny Bixler, Punky was a member of the Crips street gang. Punky was supposedly a Crip. And Zachary... Punky says that he wanted to get Zach to take his place to be able to fight like he does, and they want to run this town. It was then that Sherry and Zachary really turned on Vera. At times I lived with them and everything else, you know, they were getting along great, you know, love you, kisses and everything else. And it's like now all of a sudden, you know, Punky dies, it's, you know, I want to beat her. The pattern began to take shape. There was a candy bar and the room where they had Punky's little memorial thing. And I know Lisa Casey and Punky, they were really tight together. I guess the candy bar was supposedly for Punky and Vera ended up eating it because she was hungry and they told her she couldn't get out of the room. And Alyssa went off on her and she actually had her on the ground and she punched her like maybe twice. This game of trumping up a charge to get someone else to beat Vera was not an isolated incident. Because he was thinking of people who could beat the crap out of Vera badly. So he just got on his phone and he started calling people or texting people. And as soon as they got the word, they, they came rushing over. Zachary Brooks, tough new leader of the Finlay Crips, was texting his dead brother's old girlfriends to come over and assault his defenseless baby mama. Crystal pushes her down on the floor, and Zachary's yelling at her, come on, hit her, hit her. And they do it. The location was chosen for a very personal reason. 
they tried to do the same identical thing to Vera that happened to Travis. Take her to the railroad tracks and lay exactly. her out for a train to run over her and cut her head open and, you know. Travis Puckett was the son of Sherry's baby sister, Tabitha. My nephew Travis was 16 years old and my sister told him to get the hell out of her house and... The same age as Zachary, Travis became part of the Brooks Boys gang, hanging out at a local park riding skateboards. He went taken off the, down the road, and that's when he jumped the railroad tracks. So, like, because there's two trains coming at the same time, so he couldn't do nothing. And when Travis went to jump, Travis slipped under and off came Travis's head. He looked back like this to see his brother Curtis and when he did, the other train came, and that's when he got, she said, like hamburger. And then he was smashed up like hamburger. But what's important is not whether Sherry and Zachary consciously wanted to imitate Travis's death. It's that they told the killers about their vendetta against Vera. I think she was thinking about when Vera accidentally uh, dropped a brick on her foot. I asked her to come outside with me and help me clean the rabbit cage. And I had a tarp on top of the rabbit cage. And there was, there was like four bricks to, put, to keep the tarp on there so that way it doesn't blow away. She told me also that Vera had thrown rocks, big, huge, like, rocks onto her feet. And that's why her feet had to be wrapped. Zachary come running outside. And he said, what's wrong, Mom? I said, bitch fucking, uh threw, uh, dropped that rock on my foot, I need help. And he said, what? I said, she fucking threw that rock on my foot and it hurts, get it off. Zachary and all them, they're t saying that she intentionally did it. And I yelled at her, said, you fucking bitch. I said, you fucking hit me with the fucking rock, you fucking bitch. The slave had committed a fatal error. I assume Vera apologized and she didn't. Nope, she didn't apologize. She never apologizes. From this point on, things went downhill. It all happened events after that, after she got the bricks, was on her foot. The rock hit on Sherry's foot, and then that's when they were going to plan on throwing Vera on the tracks. <laughs> Sherry made a little joke about wanting to drug Vera with her sleeping pills and Zachary wanted to give her, get her high and everything and then mix those together and then let her walk the tracks at nighttime. Eventually she would fall over and lay right in the middle of the tracks. When she said you need to cut her up and put her on the tracks, then she looked towards Vera, smiled and turned back. And there will be no, no way of the, of the conductor to stop the train in, in time. She thought if she did get squished by the train, then there wouldn't be any fingerprints because he would be like hamburger meat. So basically she wanted to, to kill her. On Sunday, March 20th, Danny and Nicole ran from the assault charge in Tiffin and arrived at the Brooks house. That evening, they met a being named Vera who, already living in a perpetual state of terror, could no longer be considered human. She stayed in her room 24-7. She barely ever came out unless Sherry called her. She was basically like this. Wouldn't look you in the eye. Wouldn't talk if somebody walked in the house. She'd go to the bedroom by herself. But if she's sitting there and she's just curled up like this and looking up like this every now and then going back down, I mean, you get this idea that she was probably pr pretty much psychically dead as a, you know, anyway. Meanwhile, Vera's baby daddy had found a kindred spirit bonding with his long lost crip brother. Interaction between Zach and Danny. They seem very dependent on each other. Like. They, they seemed very close for just knowing each other for that little of time. For the next four days, they unleashed an animalistic rage that is hard, but not impossible to explain. Sherry Brooks and the entire family was telling Danny stories. For the past three years, he lived here 
at Allen Correctional. Guys who in prison had been raped, when they come out, it's like they want to get revenge on somebody. And gangbangers and their bloody code of survival is very, very real. Well, I know she's all about the crib stuff, because when we were at yeah. the funeral, she was talking all about Uncle Gene and Chris. Sure. And she had a blue bandana around his flowers. Do you think, do you think Sherry thinks she's a crip? Yeah, for sure. Okay. So as far as this gang affiliation, who's the first crip amongst the Brookses? Punky. This is why, when interviewed for this project, Danny's response was so chilling. When he mentioned something about Punky, they all, like, get this thing of thinking that she's disrespectful to Punky. But she was being accused of more than just disrespecting Punky. Zachary and Sherry told Danny, who was in prison when it happened, that she had murdered him. In their most vicious lie of all, knowing full well how he would react, they convinced Danny it was Vera who pushed Punky in front of the cab. Did you ever hear any of that? No, but that is just messed up just to tell anybody Vera was the one to push Punky because there was a lot of people that would take up for Punky. So not only was Vera a threat to Sherry's precious baby, Willadine, she also killed the Brooks gang's leader. Now Sherry wanted something done about it. Nicole was just another opportunity for her to do her mind games with. She wants to be a people pleaser so bad. She wants friends so bad that she just, she couldn't see it coming at all especially not with somebody as conniving as Sherry is. From what she either says or does, everybody else follows and just does what they're told. It was like the female Charlie Manson. Like if Charlie Manson had a girl for him, it would be her. If Sherry is the one that told him to do it. He did say that. Since she knew Danny was in the Crips and she believes that she is a Crip, um, she pretty much put it into Danny's mind, like, hey, help us out. Then, Sherry's little helpers got busy. Chucky's padlock from his school locker was sitting on the um, stand, and they just happened to pick it up and hook it to the, the belt. And then all of a sudden, that's when they started hitting Vera in the head and the body with it. It was their weapon of choice after that. That and a big, long paddle with a number three on it. Nicole took the paddle and beat Vera's ass, and Vera had a bruise on her ass. And all Vera had on was a t-shirt and her underwear. And the more Vera screamed, the more it became sexual. I think Nicole gets off of a lot of violence. And Nikki was like, like she was getting real excited. And then she'd go over and start kissing on Danny like she was being turned on for what she was doing. I think once Danny started beating her, he couldn't stop. He got off on it. Basically, he says, now this is getting fun. When she got hit, her hand went up like this, and it accidentally hit uh, Nicole's boob. And Nicole said, oh, bam, right across the face. Now you're doing a lesbian act on me? After the beatings, uh, Vera, they would run up to the room where they were sleeping at to pretty much get it on. The idea that after they had beaten Vera, they would go upstairs and have sex would also indicate that there was, there was some sort of real psychological thrill about this. I don't know if you know, but almost every bone in her face was broke. A lot of that's from being slugged for looking at Danny. Nick Nicole punched Vera right square in the nose like this. Vera was not even interested in Danny. That was all brought up because Sherry kept saying that, yeah, Vera will sleep with any of them. She slept with all my sons. She'll sleep with Danny, too. And then as soon as they would beat on her, they'd run right upstairs and have sex and then come right back down and beat on Vera again, like it turned them on. By this admission, when you consider whose bedroom was downstairs, Danny and Nicole were not the only ones getting off on it. It always happens in mother's room for some reason. All the beatings were in your mom? Yes. Sherry just spoke out. She just said, hit her again. She thinks it's cute of Vera having black eyes and stuff, said she looks like a little squirrel. Like, she wants everybody to know that she wanted her to be hit. She kept hitting her head like this on the um, dresser, and 
Nikki kept saying, can I kill her? Can I kill her? Can I kill her? And through it all, to quote Danny Bixler, Vera just took it. That's when he pretty much on oh, mud stomped. You know, it's a southern term. It's where when they're on the ground, you just stomp them until they're pretty much weakened to where they can't even get up again. When somebody gets beat up in prison, they call it that way. Her injuries from the mud stomping were all too evident the following day when, amazingly, they took a break from beating Vera and walked her across the street to lunch. Somebody else actually told us what she wanted. It looked like her lip had been busted right here. We talked about it after we were done, after they had left. We all said, man, did you see that girl's face? I would made the comment to uh, Shane and a couple of other people. I said, man, <laughs> she looks like she went through the windshield of a car. As it became clear the legal system was going to minimize the enormity of what had happened to Vera, frustration grew throughout the community. This led to the formation of Voices for Vera, an activist group dedicated to bringing the people who brutalized her to justice. We don't understand. We don't know why that there was only two people that was charged with this murder. There was so many people involved and there's only two people that's being charged with it except for lying to the police. Wow. Nor did anyone in the prosecutor's office figure out the author of these lies, evidenced by how the judge sentenced Sherry for passing on secondhand information that she herself had created. Mrs. Brooks has a uh, relatively long criminal history, mostly minor offenses, those of a minor nature, but at least one felony offense, albeit some years ago. With respect to Ms. Brooks' involvement in this particular case, it appears that Ms. Brooks' participation is slightly, and I underscore slightly less serious than that of the others who've been involved because it appears uh, that her crime involves the passing along of secondhand information, which nonetheless misled the officers, but it appears to be a more of a secondhand uh, information that she passed along as opposed to firsthand information. Not only was the court fooled about Sherry's role in making it the cover story, no one even bothered to determine when she told her family to say it. Who told you to, what the cover story was? Sherry? Yes. And, and, and how did that happen? Um, when Vera was sleeping from her uh, bruises, because I had to actually do her dang feet that night. Yeah, there was one night I had to do her feet because Vera was wo too wounded to. Scotty is talking about Thursday, following Vera's mud stomping. I believe, yes, I believe he did do her feet that night. And that's when she said if they would kill her, and I hope they don't, like, you know, throwing it off, that uh, we would have to have a cover story to protect this family. And him saying there was a cover story cooked up even before the murder? They had to think of something and put blame on certain people to still try to keep certain members of the family out of it. The, the secondhand information that you got. The secondhand from. information means that um, Shannon told me that they took Vera up to the tracks and that they degutted her like a fish and that they left her up there to die. And Shannon said, don't worry about it because she deserved it. It's like this. You're looking at this hand while something else is going on in this hand. But you're pretty much more interested in this hand. That's probably what was in her head, was to take Willa Dean away from Vera, get Vera out of the picture, so that she could have Willa Dean as her own child and have her raise it as hers and Michael's and it's not her child <laughs> not, I mean there's nothing ho wrong helping Vera with the child giving it a bath helping her feed her and helping her change her you know taking care of her but she didn't have to kill Vera 
have Vera killed just to take her baby from her. Yet incredible as it sounds, this absurd projection of Sherry's own motive became the basis of the state of Ohio's case against Vera's killers. To the official version of events, Danny Bixer indicated he was upset with Vera Joe for spraying um, pepper spray in the home. Not that Shannon had no involvement in Vera's murder. She did. Not, it's not only Sher Sherry that was manipulated. Um, Shannon Brooks, Michael Brooks's wife, also said that she was three months pregnant. She was never pregnant. Sherry, I guess, while I was gone, had told Danny and Nicole that that I had miscarried. I never told her that I was pregnant. Not one bit did I say that I was pregnant. Except based on these Facebook timestamps, this claim is a demonstrable lie. Because in addition to posting she was pregnant two days earlier, Shannon was talking to Sherry about it the morning of the murder. If you go with the flow, nothing's going to happen to you. However, once you go with the flow, you do get involved into it and there's sometimes no turning back. And then she saw a way out. They had said that Vera had sprayed the pepper spray upstairs to where it was really bad. Now you're saying she never even set off on it. No, Vera never did. But, yes, she, Shannon did come back furious. At who? At Vera. Shannon was like, that little bitch, if she made me lose my baby, I swear to God, I'm going to kill her. And when she got back, she said she had a miscarriage. And that she had to get a DNC and everything else that goes along with a miscarriage. Nicole had clearly developed a bond with Shannon. But she didn't understand the game. Vera caused it. But so, everything on Vera, Vera already caused everything else. Vera can cause this too. And with Danny and Nicole accepting plea bargains, the judge responded to criticism from Voices for Vera. Obviously, the facts and circumstances of this crime have been the subject of much media and public attention. Then, then to hear the judge say, oh, we're going to provide adequate punishment for the ones involved in this 30 days deferred with five years probation and two and a half years reserved. Dude, put him in jail. Many interested persons have spoken out in the news media. Do you think this is one step toward uh, some justice? I mean, what, what's going through your mind? I'm hoping it's one step towards justice. Others have used various forms of social media to express their views. It is, of course, the right of all of our citizens to speak freely and openly, especially on matters of great personal and public interest. But while the sanctity of free speech is beyond question, it must also be remembered that opinion unconnected to fact, the law, or for that matter, reality must be rejected. But what is the reality the court accepted? Daniel Bixler, Shannon Brooks, Zachary Brooks, Garth Brooks, Sherry Brooks, and I agreed to kill Vera Jo Regal on March 26, 2011. We agreed to do this because Shannon Brooks said Vera Jo Regal caused her to miscarry. Only, was this really the motive? Well, I guess if you believe the source used by Nicole's lawyers. Nikki's uh, lawyer had came to the house to talk to me and was wondering why was Vera killed? Was it because of jealousy? Because Nikki thought she wanted Danny? Or was it because of the miscarriage? And I said, I said, well, for one, Vera always will and always will love Zachary. And she went to her grave loving Zachary. So imagine Sherry's delight at being presented with this smorgasbord of her own lies. Vera was killed later on because of the miscarriage of Shannon. But events leading up to the murder paint a very different picture. For example, the first time Vera got stabbed wasn't even that day. She went into the bathroom and Danny and them followed her. That's the first stabbing was when Danny stabbed her in the leg. Well, Sherry said she took her finger and stuck it in the hole of this uh, where the hole of her sore where they stabbed her. My finger went that far into her leg. This is no nightmare. This was Vera's final day of life. That is one of the ones that were mean to Vera. Sorry. Yes. She had to um, pick up the dog poop of Jackson and eat it. I think they said Chucky. 
I'm made pretty her sure eat him. the dog poop. They're all sadistic. They're all, they all had to have been. Talking about they took a plunger and put it up. And... They sodomized her with it, yeah. She was completely naked, that she was on her menstrual period that day. They took a toothbrush, they raped her sexually with the toothbrush. And then she had to use it for her mouth. The following morning, five hours before the mace incident, they were trying to stab her again. Daniel actually um, gave me a knife and asked me if I wanted to um, slice her, you know, cut her up. This was during a visit from Punky's baby mama, Angel Might. I do know Zachary was hitting her, and then I can't remember if it was Danny or Nicole or both of them that actually started hitting her too. And telling her to, you know, shut up, bitch, be quiet. I'm hitting you, you know, shut the fuck up and, you know, just hit her. Yeah, her and her mother and her brother sat there for 45 minutes, they said, watching this uh, episode going on. Not only Nicole and Danny, but then also little Chucky started getting into it. Because I saw him with a fishing pole striking Vera. Sherry had made up this thing I don't know how true it was, but supposedly Vera had given little K sour milk. She had gave him, uh, little K the same milk that he went to bed on instead of coming out and rinsing the cup out and giving him fresh milk. She just went on and gave that to him and told him, get back on the couch and lay back down and covered him up. She was scared. All, cr I mean, all, all crunched up in a little ball, like in a fetal position. She lifted her head once, and I saw a cut on her nose, a split lip. A half hour after Angel and her mother left, the street fight between the Brookses and the rival neighborhood gang broke out, and someone called the police. This sent Danny, Nicole, and Zachary running to his Aunt Sam's, Samantha Schwab's. They hid there in the basement until the police left and were next seen two hours later, walking in an alley three miles away. I was getting ready to leave to head over to take my kids someplace, and they was walking up the alley towards my house, and they're like, where are you going? I said, well, we're leaving. He goes, can you get ready to my house? George Speck lives by the Brooks Gang's favorite hangout, the skateboard park. Who, who all did you give a ride to? Nicole Peters, Daniel Big, Danny Bixler, and Zachary. His house is also near something else, the railroad tracks where Vera was murdered. Danny, Nicole, and Zachary was at Samantha Swab's house over here and walked down these tracks around 4.30. Now, are you telling me that they did not go and try to scout out a place to kill Vera five hours later? From the bridge, they continued down the tracks toward Alan Capp's apartment, which is beside that rail line, too. So in addition to casing the murder scene, they were also plotting their escape. And we just started walking. We were, we were going to walk to somebody's house, and they were supposed to take us to Kentucky. We know this was their plan because the following day, after Vera was dead and Danny and Nicole were arrested, Zachary started desperately calling Gina, trying to use the escape route for himself. Every time he'd call, I'd be like, no, you don't need to be coming down here. They're just going to put more stuff on you for running away. Now, mind you, Danny nor Nicole knew George Speck or Alan Cap. So, who's the ringleader? And uh, where is his sentence? When is he going to get charged for all of this? By the time the three co-conspirators were riding across town in the back of George's pickup, they already had a cover story, the murder scene scouted, and an escape plan ready to hatch. By 5.15, the Brooks house was filled with pepper spray, forcing a complete evacuation. The mace was upstairs, but it was coming downstairs once Danny opened the door. All the windows were open. They were airing the house out. Hospital records show Shannon arrived at the ER at 5.32 p.m. Around the same time, while the Brooks house was being aired out from the mace, Danny and Nicole walked over to his sister's place. And he told me that they just asked him all day to do something about her. But was he in a rage strong enough to kill Vera? They were just, you know, saying how much they 
they don't want her around anymore. And I mean, I just figured that they would either kick her out or something like that, or just tell her to get her kid and leave. But that wasn't even, obviously that wasn't what they were thinking. From what I've been told is that you were getting this kind of pressure before the mace ever went off. So by elevating Shannon from bit player to a starring role, prosecutors got it backwards. Like breaking her nose for pushing the baby into a coffee table, or beating her to a pulp for eating Punky's Kit Kat bar. They needed a rationalization to blame the victim. An excuse to punish her. That means Vera was not killed because they accused her of setting off the mace. They accused her of setting off the mace for a reason to kill her. It, it was mainly all coming from Sherry and Zach. They were the main two that was pushing everything towards me and Nicole. They, they were offering me money and everything to take care of her, to get rid of her. At 9 o'clock, Zachary summoned Danny, Nicole, and his brother Garth to Scotty's room. I overheard the things and um I was pretty much like nah they're not really going to do it this meeting was to decide where to kill Vera Danny wanted to do it in a park they checked out earlier in the day which he felt was more secluded you remember that um park Ellen that me you and Garth went fishing at it's right over there by you know center Street that yeah that park that goes down Center Street, right by the bridge. But Zachary wanted to go back to the bridge, insisting they stick to the plan of having the train turn Vera's body into hamburger. They wanted everybody to think that the train hit her. Hit her. As the murderers went into action, Vera began to panic. When they told her to put her shoes on, you know, she kind of, she was like yelling, why? You know, like, why? Why do you want me to get my shoes on? And Zachary had went up to her and said, just get your effing shoes on, you know? So who, she, who was telling her to put her shoes on? Zachary and Danny. And then Nicole had come in and uh, she was standing right by uh, Vera's door and she's like, you need to put your damn shoes on right now. And then Vera didn't hesitate as she put her shoes on and Zachary said he was going to go with them. But apparently this was no comfort because judging Vera's reaction, she was just as scared to leave with Zachary. I think she knew what was going to happen. Um, I was sitting on the couch right by her room. She was looking at me for like a way out. Like, you know, she was trying to tell me to help her. When it became clear Shannon was no help, she reached out to Scotty. She knew what's gonna come. That's why she asked me to come along with her. Because, you know, she felt safe with him and she wanted Scotty to walk with her. But I told her, hold up, I would have to go upstairs real quick to get my shoes. Well, as I went, got upstairs, I was, pretty much was stopped from leaving. Who stopped you? Um, I was supposed to say Danny. It wasn't. It was Zachary who stopped me. Who told you to say Danny? My mother. But, um, like I said, Zachary's the one who stopped me. Not Danny, even though I told the police it was Danny. And why would he say that? That, I think he already knew what was up and he wanted to protect me. Scotty was not the only one prevented from going. When Zachary was told to go upstairs to get Scotty, it was right at that time that she told Zachary, no, you're not going to be a part of what they're going to do. Then they hustled Vera outside, ignoring her pleas for her life. She said, I don't want to go. I want to stay here. And she was crying. Vera was crying, wanted to stay home. And Nicole said, no, you're going with me now. I'm going to crack your head right here on the porch. The temperature was below freezing that night. Yet Danny wore a borrowed pair of dark blue gym shorts out of respect for their former owner, Punky Brooks. He also wore a blue Crips bandana, signaling this was official gang business. The ones that they believe happened first, because then there was over, like, over uh, lay where people had stabbed the same areas. From what I heard, the first ones 
were weaker, coming from a weaker person, a female, possibly. She was cut from ear, almost ear to ear in a very sort of sawing motion that was described as by the coroner. This initial failed attempt, as Vera's recovered sweatshirt shows, happened while she was still dressed. And one final act of humiliation, they forced her to strip. Yeah, they found the clothes around, scattered around the, in the trees and stuff, in the bushes. They found, like, her panties and I think her shirt. They took them off and then just threw them. Didn't even try to, like, hide that. The full day to day and a half before the murder actually happened, that they were completely messed up the whole time. Like, there was not one sober moment. He was heavily using alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, and by his own account, an excessive amount of ecstasy. When questioned about why Vera was made to get naked, Nicole Peters replied, it wasn't working at first. Asked what his girlfriend meant by this odd statement, Danny Bixler explained, that knife was dull as hell and she couldn't get it through the clothes. Which, by strange coincidence, is the exact same reason given by Sherry Brooks. I can think of is if you take your clothes off, well, then you get to get to the bare skin and it'll go faster. These details, told in separate jailhouse interviews by two people Sherry had not spoken to since the night of the murder, are something only the killers would know. When they were stabbing at her, maybe it wasn't that she was dying fast enough for him because of the clothes. When you stab somebody that snags the clothes, 
So what appeared to be a staged sexual assault was actually just laziness, and they needed Vera's help to make it easier to kill her. It's almost as if he's attempting to minimize his conduct. There's 21 stab wounds, but he said he only did six. But an examination of those six stab wounds is also very telling. First, the legs. Why was she stabbed in the legs? He said it was to keep her from running away so they could continue the abuse. So she couldn't get out of that situation. Then he mounted her from behind, reached around, and cut her throat. They tried to cut her head off, but couldn't get through this bone here. So it's like cut from here to this, your spine bone back there. I think they laid her out on the tracks after they slaughtered her neck to make it look like the train cut her neck like that. And then they fled, leaving Vera behind, still alive. He left her to bleed out on the railroad tracks alone, <laughs> naked and in the cold. And from there, he told the detectives he went to party. So they were in like, I mean, they were, they were celebrating. celebrating, yeah. They called me up and then they told me what they did. Well, I thought they were messing with me. So I walked back to their house to see if it was true. I look at Nicole and she just got, she got this big smile on her face, you know, and she puts her arms out like this, like she wants me to hug her. And she's like, it's done, it's done, no more. And I was scared. And she just comes in and hugs me. When they did come back, um, Danny went over to Zachary and patted him on the back. When I go back in the living room and Danny's in there high-fiving Zachary, and then they go into Sherry's room and they're both, you know, kind of laughing. And I got there, they were, talk they were talking about how they killed her and stuff, but... I didn't believe it, because after they said they did it, Sherry was talking about how she was with Larry, her boyfriend. And then that's when uh, Nicole had said, I got my first hair drop. I finally got it. And she says it's to Sherry? She says it's to Sherry. And she gives Sherry a hug, and Sherry hugs her back, and they start laughing. And why wouldn't they celebrate? To them, Vera was the abuser of baby Willadine, killer of Punky, smasher of Sherry's feet. Now that evil bitch was out of Zachary's life and she left without taking Sherry's baby. They came back and switched clothes and then pretty much went out to get drunk. Well, Sherry called me and said Danny wants to come back over. While Vera's body was still warm, Nicole was visibly excited. She was excited and ecstatic. She wasn't sorry. You could see that in her face. She's was smiling and happy and just, you know, like, I've never seen somebody that happy before. But on the tracks, something was happening. Vera was becoming an angel, and she had a few surprises. Using her last ounce of energy, she pulled herself off the rails and contracted into a ball only 12 inches high. She curled up in a fetal position. That's why she always slept in a fetal position. Miraculously, this allowed the front of the train, which police later found to have a 13-inch clearance, to pass over without touching her. I started feeling like something was wrong when Zach decided to pretty much drink the entire bottle, one entire bottle of vodka to himself. The angel started haunting Zachary, whose actions the rest of that night speak for themselves. Zachary said out loud that he only went to get drunk so he can forget about the whole entire thing. And he looked all depressed and upset about something like he was involved deeply with his own thoughts. Zach was doing like weird stuff like like hit his head on walls and stuff. And I was talking to him I'm like so why why is he so sad and I'm like what's going on and then that's when Danny decided to say well I, I slit her throat and I was like what'd you do? He's like I slit that bitch's throat. So it was Zach's guilty conscience that led Desta to confront her brother, which ultimately broke open the case. They're sick. They need help. But when it's their time and they have to meet their maker, hey. And when it came to motive, on the final day of court, the judge admitted he still had no idea why the murder happened. As we grapple to make sense of this, perhaps as some have suggested that our community has failed Vera Jo Regal, and I'm sure that debate will continue. But we must also not forget that there were those who were directly responsible for Ms. Regal's death, and in particular, Defendant Daniel Bixler, who is here today for the court for sentencing. 
The evidence reveals that on March 26, 2011, the defendant assumed the role of self-appointed judge, jury, and executioner. For what? Jealousy, revenge, unfocused rage, some perverse sense of family honor? It doesn't appear we'll ever really know. I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine. In the end, Vera I'm is an angel. One whose wretched life and bad death shines a light on the rest of us. And you're at this time, I'd like to read a letter that was found in Vera Joe's purse after she was uh, murdered. And this is what it says. It says, I love you, Willa Dean. You are a good little baby girl to us. I'm glad to be your mommy. And I'm glad that I had you on November 4th at 4.16 a.m. Six pounds, two ounces, 19 inches long. Mommy loves you. Worse, by not getting convicted of a major felony, Zachary still had parental rights to Willadine. Oh yeah, or they would not be making a revocation plan for Zachary to get his daughter back. A case already being discussed when Zachary's friend Alan Cap arrived at 10 o'clock on the night of the murder. All I heard is some about them wanting to kill Vera about custody. She had that in her mind that that's her kid now and that and Vera had it, but that's her kid now, and she's going to keep it. And she had to get rid of Vera because Vera wanted to move out and take the baby, too. Like, I was right here, and then their room's, like, right here. They're all in a group talking about killing Vera. Okay, so custody meaning what? Like, if Vera dies, then Zach gets custody. But why, at this moment, were they celebrating Zachary getting sole custody According to the lawyers, it was all about Shannon's phony miscarriage, wasn't it? They were talking about Zach having custody. Nah, they didn't ever said anything about Shannon. A version of events confirmed by the killer himself. And did they give it an indication of why they wanted this done with Vera? Mainly because they wanted Vera out of the picture, and they knew if Vera left the house and that. It is a hope Sherry still holds strong as she sits in great anticipation, waiting for the return of her lost little baby girl. I added daddy to the picture. <laughs> Had to copy her daddy there because I'm getting ready to frame it and uh, start to show him. Zachary and her look alike. It's nearing the end of June, and we just passed your birthday, the first one that you spent underground. And I really
coast, now I'm in the East Coast. Show you 